Hello everyone and welcome to today's event. This is the first in this term series of research seminars hosted by the British Centre for Literary Translation at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, England. My name is Duncan Large. I'm the BCLT's academic director and coordinator of the research seminar. As with previous events, this seminar is being recorded and the recording will be available soon on BCLT's YouTube channel, where you'll also find recordings of previous seminars and other events that we've hosted. I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, who is Laura McLaughlin. Laura has been a freelance translator from Catalan and Spanish since she completed the Masters in Literary Translation at UEA back in 2007. She was awarded the inaugural BCLT Catalan English Translation Mentorship in 2011. She's translated work by, among others, Belle Olid, Luisa Cunillet, Maria Barbal, Flavia Compagni, Tony Hill Gumbau, and Juan Brossa, as well as director Carlos Saura from the Museum of Contemporary Art in Barcelona and the Association of Writers in Catalan. Her most recent publication is a translation of Wilder Winds by Belle Olid from Fum de Stampa Press uh, earlier this year. And uh, I noticed that uh, back in February, Laura made a recording of uh, her, herself reading Baba Luba from Wilder Winds on Translators Aloud's YouTube channel. So I'll pop that in the, I'll pop a link to that in the chat for everyone so for you to follow up uh, after today's event. The most pertinent aspect of uh, Laura's CV is that she is currently translator in residence at BCLT. So she's very much one of our own, uh, I'm very pleased to say, and she'll be saying more about her current translation project that she's working on uh, during her residency in the course of her talk. Uh, before I hand over to Laura, let me just say that after her talk, there'll be plenty of time for questions. Um, so we're using the Zoom webinar platform. What that means is that you can submit questions via the Q&A function, um, and that allows you to see other people's questions and to upvote those um, if you like the questions that other, others have answered. Um, we also have the chat function working uh, as well, and I can see some contributions uh, already, and that's for uh, other kinds of comments, of course, during, during the talk. Um, for now, though, it's my great pleasure to hand over to Laura, and uh, Laura's talk is entitled The Translator as Liberator, Finding the Echoes in Translation. Laura, welcome. Thank you, Duncan, um, for those very generous words. <laughs> and thank you all for being here. Um, I hope you enjoy um, finding out a little bit more about the echoes in translation. During her 2011 Sebald lecture in, uh, titled Loosed in Translation, Ali Smith asked an intriguing question that I've been turning over in my mind ever since. In a neat re reversal of the tired old trope, she ponders, rather than what is lost in translation, what is loosed, freed, and liberated in translation. As a fledgling translator myself, already used to the discourse of poetry being lost in translation, the notion of a translator as a traitor, this expansiveness, this generosity, in describing the act of translation felt like a revelation. As we know all too well, translation is often described by non-translators, I hasten to add, as derivative, uh, no more than a pale imitation of a text. So the idea of a translation as being equal to, or even more than its source was exciting, even heady. It almost felt as if she was giving translators overt permission to be part of the creative process, part of making meaning, to be writers themselves. Over the course of her lecture, she goes on to describe how various translators had answered this question, 
But I was left with a dizzying thought. What is loosed, freed, or liberated in my translations? Having mulled over this question for many years of working as a translator, I've come to call what's loosed in my translations echoes. In Ovid's telling of the myth of Echo and Narcissus, Echo is a nymph admired for the magnificence of her voice. Zeus instructs her to distract Juno from his philandering ways by talking to her. When Juno realizes that she has been taken in by Echo's talkative ways, Juno curses her by making her able only to repeat the last word spoken to her and without the ability to produce speech of her own. She falls in love with Narcissus as soon as she lays eyes on him, but cannot call out to him, merely repeat his words, and he spurns her. He then proceeds to fall in love with his own reflection as Echo wastes away, leaving only her voice in the aural effect named after her. It's an alluring image, a potent metaphor which has endured in Western artistic expression throughout the centuries. Pre-Raphaelite artist John William Waterhouse was inspired to create a painting of the myth. Jacques Derrida uses Echo to illustrate his speech is blind philosophical musings. But even so, Echo has often been couched in faintly or overtly derogatory tones no more than a ha hollow half sound, immediately less than the original, at least in the context of translation. However, in her own Zebald lecture last year, in praise of Echo, Pulitzer Prize winning writer Jhumpa Lahiri reimagines Echo. She suggests that while Ovid sees Echo's inability to say anything except repeat what is said to her as a punishment, Echo can be seen in a different light. While Narcissus is self-absorbed and selfish, Echo is empathetic, and far from merely parroting the words of others, she is a translator who, quote, restores the meaning of a text by means of an elaborate alchemical process that requires imagination, ingenuity, and freedom, end quote. In this way, it might be said that Echo embodies the very spirit of translation. Bolstered by this imagination and freedom, and with the space and time given to me in this residency, I have followed in Jhumpa Lahiri's admittedly very striking and erudite footsteps by redefining Echo, and formed into words a part of the act of translation which has been hitherto mostly intuitive. To my mind, echoes in translation are the elements that swirl around a text, reverberate in your mind as you read, the sparks of recognition or inspiration you feel as you move word by word through a novel or poem or play, mentally nudging it into a shape you recognize even before you've written a word. In my experience, Echoes can be broadly divided into three, three kinds, linguistic, contextual, and literary. And while they're not necessarily present in every text or even perhaps for every translator, in this talk, I'll discuss how these echoes have spoken to me. Linguistic echoes. I've always been aware that my professional life as a translator has been split, albeit unevenly, between two languages, the dominant world language of Spanish and the smaller, smaller tongue of Catalan. There is a delicious irony in the fact that a so-called minor language of Europe has dominated my translation career, but I digress. However, the duality of languages I translate into only occurred to me recently. While I understand it and can read it, I'm not a native speaker of Irish. My family aren't Irish speakers, and I've lived in the UK for over a decade and a half. Therefore, despite loving the language, I'd never claim to be able to translate from or into Irish. 
Nevertheless, the rhythms and cadences of Irish are knitted into the fabric of the English spoken in Ireland, Hiberno English, my English, so deeply that unconsciously Irish drifts into my translations like a semantic ghost. So unconsciously, in fact, that it wasn't until an editor of a recent translation of mine brought it up that I even considered this at all. He told me that in my translation of Bella Lid's collection of short stories, Wilder Winds, my Irish roots come across in the slightly free flowing form and sentence construction. The segment that he quoted to reinforce his point was this. Let me just share my screen. Soc de la tribu, yo tambe, de bustu bestias, en banyu nua, pero soc de la tribu. And in my translation, I'm a part of the tribe, me too. I draw beasts, I swim naked, but I'm part of the tribe. Oops. Uh, stop share. To me, this sentence sounded both close to the source text and standard English, yet apparently the emphatic me too, present in the Catalan, as well as the construction of the first sentence, had inflections of Hiberno English to his British ear. Given that I'd merely translated the author's words into what I believed was very standard, straightforward English, I was fascinated by the suggestion that he could hear echoes of Hiberno English and therefore Irish, to which I'd been oblivious. It felt as though the process of translation itself had unlocked, had somehow liberated languages within me I believed to be dormant. This offhand remark led me to wonder whether there were any other unwitting traces of Hiberno English in my translations or perhaps even linguistic touching points between the original Catalan and Irish. To that end, I consulted a description of the features of Hiberno-English in Terence Dolan's A Dictionary of Hiberno-English. Some I did recognize, like the overt extension of the imperative to the second person, as in, let you sit down, and the distinctive use of the de definite article, but there were other elements of Hiberno English so innate and natural, I didn't realize they weren't standard English at all. One example is the different way of using the verbs bring and take. In standard English, usage of these verbs depends on direction. You take something from here to there, while you bring something to here from there. In Hiberno English, however, you take only when accepting something from someone else and bring on all other occasions. Discovering this difference has really illuminated queries from editors on this very question during the proofing stage of a translation. Even so, it seemed unlikely that there would be any other points where Catalan and Hiberno English, one, a Romance language derived from Latin, and the other a Germanic language with a Celtic language shadow, might touch, but I found one. Dolan suggests that in Hiberlo English, there is a tendency to introduce a redundant personal pronoun after a proper noun, and gives the example Mr. Maguire, he read his poems to me. In Bello Lid's story, Baba Luba, also in Wilder Winds, the author similarly uses redundant pronouns, but inverts them and ends sentences with Baba Luba's name. For example, No va dormir de les nits següents, Baba Luba. She didn't sleep well the following nights, Baba Luba. 
Va tornar sola a casa aquel día, Babaluba. She came home alone that day, Babaluba. This kind of non-standard word order, so much a part of the narrative voice of this story, feels utterly natural to me. Indeed, since writing this, I've caught myself unwittingly using this grammatical construction in conversation. And as I look back over earlier drafts of this translation, it's clear I didn't hesitate to retain it in English, with no thought of making it seem less odd or idiosyncratic, allowing this echo to reverberate in my translation. It seems that despite living outside of Ireland for a decade and a half, the English I write in and translate to is irrevocably my English, the English of Ireland. And the echoes of Hiberno-English and Irish are going to bubble up from my subconscious and settle on the pages of my translations. Contextual echoes. What I call contextual echoes are the more visible signs in a text of the social and cultural context of its origin that presents challenges in translation, like dialect, slang, and the specific political and linguistic backdrop to the story. One challenge that consistently arises in translating Catalan literature is the presence of Spanish within the text. It often signals an encounter either with authority or people from outside Catalonia. But when both languages are translated into English, this subtle linguistic shift becomes imperceptible, inaudible, a loss or silence within the text. Therefore, a variety of strategies are required to make these nuances audible to Anglophone readers. For example, in Stone in a Landslide, my translation of Maria Barbal's beloved classic, Pedra de Tartera, there is a key moment of linguistic tension it seemed especially important to recreate. During the Spanish Civil War, narrative Concha has been taken from her home in rural Catalonia and brought to a prison simply because she is married to a well-known socialist and one of her neighbors had denounced her. During her first night in prison with her daughters, she encounters a soldier acting as a guard. Let me share my screen. Entra un soldat amb un ulls que semblen voler-se li escapar del cap, cridant, silencio i a dormir. Note the differences in my translation. A soldier comes in, his eyes bulging out of his head. He shouts in Spanish, silencio y a dormir. Shut up and go to sleep. As you can see, my strategy was twofold. Not only did I overtly state that the soldier was speaking in Spanish to these Catalan women, I also retained his words in the original Spanish, immediately following them with a translation. Through this edition, I hoped to emphasize the sense of alienation these Catalan women are feeling to the reader. There is also a small but significant change in my translation. The Spanish word silencio becomes shut up in English. More aggressive, certainly, but it serves to further highlight the soldier's position of authority as a Spanish speaker, especially in these early days of the Civil War. This linguistic nuance also arises in Sand Through Her Fingers, another story in Wilder Winds, in which the main character is doing work experience as a teacher in a center for juvenile delinquents. The majority of her pupils come from elsewhere. And Olid signals this to the reader by having them speak Spanish throughout the story. There is in fact so much dialogue in Spanish that repeatedly adding the words in Spanish as I had in Stone in a Landslide would sound clunky and labored, especially in a story of only 2,500 words. So I added the phrase just once 
to emphasize the subtle linguistic distance between the teacher and her pupils and trusted the reader to understand without needing to over explain. While on this topic, I will own up to the fact that there was an echo in the story I didn't hear. One of the characters, a teenager who inadvertently injures the teacher, is named Chori in the Catalan. While translating, I thought nothing of this other than reflecting that it was an unusual name. My translation had been through the editing process with a Catalan speaking editor and had reached proof stage when the author emailed us both to point out that the name Chori comes from chorizo and is common slang for a thief. No other character has a name with such symbolism and we wanted to preserve this distinction in English. So Chori becomes sneaky in my translation. I will admit that hearing these faint echoes is immeasurably easier when you have a patient author to consult. <laughs> Linguistic, pardon me, uh, literary echoes. Perhaps the easiest echoes to identify are literary. An intrinsic part of the act of translation, as I'm sure other translators can attest, is the initial close reading of the text during which we might hear echoes of other books we've already read in the target literary landscape that are somehow kin to the translation to be, even before it has been written, before it has taken shape, whispering to us that this book is like, yet not like, that book. Poet and translator George Zazertes acknowledges these bonds and describes translation as unleashing a concordance of possibility for kinship that was always there. For, as Walter Binyamin says, languages are not strangers to one another. I'd go a little further and suggest that literatures of different languages are not strangers to one another. This exercise of recognizing literary siblings has always been hugely helpful for me in the process of translation. And I first became aware of it while translating Flavia Compagni's novel, Lilia de l'Ultima Veritat, or The Island of Last Truth in my translation from Catalan. The novel takes the form of a former shipwreck and sailor recounting his story of being marooned with one other man on a desert island to his lover who promises to write his story after his death. Over the course of the book, the reader discovers that the narrator isn't all he claims to be. While reading it for the first time, echoes from the English narrative tradition kept ringing in my ears, especially the narrator's isolation, like Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, and a sense of vague uneasiness reminiscent of William Golding's Lord of the Flies. Despite one being published over 250 years ago, and the other more than 60 years ago, both novels seem to be literary ancestors of the Island of Last Truth. Let's take a look at a quote from Robinson Crusoe. I could not forbear getting up to the top of a little mountain and looking out to sea in hopes of seeing a ship. Then fancy that, at a vast distance, I spied a sail, pleased myself with the hopes of it, and, after looking steadily, till I was almost blind, lose it quite, and sit down and weep like a child, and thus increase my misery by my folly. And now a quote from the Island of Last Truth. He realises that for the first two weeks, despite Susan's warnings, he'd been scanning the horizon, to try to detect the passing of a ship. By the third week, perhaps convinced that they really were alone in the middle of the Atlantic and no one would come to save them, he'd begun to pay more attention to his needs. While the styles are clearly very different, there is a common note of despair and resignation. Likewise, if we compare Lord of the Flies to the, the Island of Last Truth, 
There's nothing in it, of course, just a feeling. But you can feel as if you're not hunting, but being hunted, as if something's behind you all the time in the jungle. The same sense of an inhospitable, unfriendly landscape occurs in my translation. This was land in the middle of the sea. It was like sailing without managing to move from the place. It was terrible. Listening for these echoes and acknowledging them nourished my thinking for the task ahead. And keeping the contrasting styles of these narratives in mind was key as I flitted between the intimacy of the novel's first person narrative and its more aloof third person sections. These echoes also gave me a deeper understanding of the book as I grew aware of a hidden layer of meaning in the novel. The structure of shifting perspectives throughout subtly points to the final revelation in its closing pages. Once you begin to locate a book's literary siblings, as I call them, you uncover multitudes. Fainter echoes of this novel include Joseph Conrad's memoir of his seafaring days, The Mirror of the Sea, as well as Jan Martel's Booker Prize winning novel, The Life of Pi, but I restrained myself. These deeper searches can lead down a rabbit hole of procrastination and it can be all too easy to stray away from the task of translation and impending deadlines. I've also heard these echoes resonating in my current work in progress. It's a novella called La Planta Carnivora, also by Flavia Compagne, tentatively titled Venus Flytrap in my translation, and an account of an abusive relationship between two women. This is no love story, but a tale of toxic love in which the narrator is being ridiculed, scorned, and ultimately consumed by her lover the metaphorical carnivorous plant of the title. The novella is ingeniously structured in 81 short chapters, all numbered one, like a labyrinth with no way out, often directly addressing the reader and interspersed with nine fables of human cruelty. It's unique and inventive, yet to my mind, it shares some literary genes with Carmen Maria Machado's absorbing and stunningly innovative memoir in the dream house. Like Compagne, Machado also positions her memoir as a second person narrative, but she titles its vignettes using literary genres and tropes, which both underlines her, her developing voice as a writer and highlights the invisibility of this kind of toxic relationship in literature. Let's first take a look at a quote from In the Dream House. You feel sick to your stomach almost constantly. The slightest motion makes you nauseated. There is a burning in your gut, cramping too. Acid, probably, and hopefully not cancer. You develop a tremor in your limbs, a weird closed down sensation in your esophagus. You cry for no reason. You can't come, can't look her in the eye can't bring yourself to go to one more bar. Machado's description of the physical effects of abuse resonates in Venus Flytrap too. You learn to vomit inwards and to feel vertigo inwards too. You pray if you know how, and if not, you make up the words. You talk to yourself inwards always. You say things like, now this is unbearable like now how evil. You advise yourself, stay quiet, stay quiet, stay quiet. This is very normal, you know, because you reach a point that you don't talk to anyone. These are books written in very different cultural contexts, yet we can see that in the similarly claustrophobic exploration of abusive relationships, they speak to one another as kin. Of course it can happen, but the echoes we find aren't always appropriate or appreciated and they have their limitations. I'll mention two examples from Wilder Winds that demonstrate how one echo can resonate while another does not. 
In the story titled Linda, a girl reacts to catcalling by racking the ladder the perpetrator is on so he can feel how catcalls unnerve her. Then she stops, puts her headphones on and walks away. Camina como si el carré fosse, in the original, becomes struts as if the streets were hers, in my translation. She walks in Catalan, but struts in English. I wanted to highlight the empowerment I sensed her feeling after she unnerves the catcaller. The word strut, with all its connotations of arrogance and triumph, was echoing in my mind and seemed to better encapsulate the meaning implicit in the Catalan. Both editor and author also heard this echo of mine and approved this choice. Not so with my translation of a title of another story. It's about a girl returning to her family home for her mother's birthday. Driving towards the family home, she grows more and more tense in anticipation of arguments and tension. She and her younger brother have always loved white noise on the radio and static on the television. The title in Catalan is Estatica, which literally means statics, as in the science. But I didn't feel that this title was apt for my translation, especially as the plural would be less familiar to readers in English than the singular, static. Thinking about the fleeting rush of happiness the girl in the story feels at being with her family again, I thought that a neat, rather clever, if perhaps a little gimmicky, solution would be to call the story ecstatic with the letters EC in parenthesis and thereby echo the emotions of the story. But it was not to be. The author indicated that this was not their intention. So this echo faded into nothing and the story is named static in English. A worthwhile reminder that the echoes you find don't always sound for others. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, it was hearing Ali Smith's impassioned Sabol lecture in 2011 that led this intuitive theory of mine to blossom into thought. But actually the seed was planted long before. Until last year, I was a bookseller an old school bookseller of long standing. Besides gaining a profound knowledge of literature, books, and the Anglophone market for books, one of the strengths I developed in that role was being able to gauge what books a reader would like based on the books they read, if asked for a recommendation. As well as translating and bookselling, I also began to write readers' reports for publishers which fine-tuned my ability to see where books from Catalan Spanish might fit into the Anglophone literary ecosystem, which books might flourish in foreign soil, as it were, and which might not. And seeing these kinships between books has become an intuitive, even involuntary process. This idea of finding echoes in translation comes first and foremost from being a reader, which is what we translators are, the closest, most generous, most dedicated readers of a text. In the translator as writer, Peter Bush declares, a translator's readings are not those of the casual reader, however well-informed and engaged. They develop in the context of a rewriting of the text in another language and culture where it will be read as an original text. As a translator, I'm reading a book, but I'm already translating. While reading a text in Catalan or Spanish, be it for a reader's report or a translation, I do so with a notebook and pen beside me where I jot down authors or books evoked in certain phrases or lines or even thoughts liberated by the prose. These scribbles are the echoes I hear as I translate, as I rewrite a text in English. Finding echoes then is simply an active form of reading. And in my experience of translation, 
I can only begin this process of rewriting when these echoes have been heard and acknowledged. But what use are these echoes really? I hear you ask. How does reading around and beyond the text help us translate? Given that I've already acknowledged their limitations, perhaps this pursuit of echoes of mine is pointless. But I stand by my belief that everything we read, and indeed every echo we hear, shapes our outlook, our voices, and the selves we bring to it each translation. All our reading, writing, thinking, leads to that moment in which we stand before a text, ready to shape it into another language. And these elements, which I've called echoes, resonate just beyond your translation in mind to act as guiding lights through the fog as you forge a path for your translation. In conclusion, let us circle back to the beginning and the first part of the title of my talk. Reading it back now, I wince a little at the slightly imperialistic overtones in a, a translator as plunderer or translator as crusader kind of way. But I promise you, these were unintentional. Inspired as ever by Ali Smith, I was thinking about a translator liberating these echoes this added meaning and the subsequent loosening of the target language, which can only happen through the translation process. Besides, I'm by no means the first translator to be thinking about translation in terms of liberation and freedom. Why the acclaimed translator, Marga Jules Costa, lauds what she calls the freedom within the constraint of translation. And in the words of another prize-winning translator and writer, Lydia Davis, we are the ones who get liberated. We get freed from our provincial boundaries when we read work in translation. We translators both liberate and are liberated through the act of translation. So, in a final flourish of rewriting a text, I will exert my right to change the title of this talk. I called it Translator as Liberator, Finding the Echoes in Translation. But in the course of considering my process as a literary translator and sharing it with you, any number of alternative titles have presented themselves. Translator as Reader, Translator as Writer, translator as rewriter, or perhaps most fittingly, given the echoes of translation which continue to resonate in my mind, I'd like to rename it translator as listener. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. That was terrific. Thank you so much. Um, I really, it's such a rich uh, notion and you've brought out so many of its aspects already uh, in your talk. And I lo love the way that you're, you were uh, illustrating by drawing on uh, so many features of your own um, translations. Uh, there are a, a number of very positive comments already in the chat. Uh, thank you for those. I noticed one um, uh, point of information from Bab Spicer as well, uh, pointing out that uh, in reference to one of the uh, points in your talk, chore is the verb to steal in Scots stroke Doric. Um, uh, but uh, do please um, uh, pop any questions in the Q&A and we have, as I mentioned earlier, we've got uh, plenty of time to uh, uh, put your questions to Laura uh, around her own translation practice and in particular the subject of her talk today, the, the, the notion of echoes um, and the, the different um, uh, valences of that that term as you, you, you drew out the notion of linguistic echoes, contextual echoes, 
and literary echoes. I wonder if I could perhaps uh, ask a, a first question, um, really following on from where you you finish uh, your your talk and thinking about the the translator then as listener. I thought that was a very nice very nice uh, conclusion. The way you uh, double back on your uh, on your title and of course it's adding a further level of kind of, of kind of the acoustics of uh, translation to the 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 image of um, of echoes. Um, just a, a, a sort of basic question, really, to, for me to start off with. When when thinking about echoes, um, you're clearly not just talking about reading out your translation and hearing how the language works, but presumably that's part of what you're interested in uh, in talking about uh, echoes. Because your first category was linguistic echoes and. Um, I imagine then that those linguistic echoes are more easily audible if you are literally reading out to yourself. I imagine that's something that you do as a translator in the course of your work. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I think, I think, I mean, I didn't, I, again, I mean, I, I, I think I, I say in the talk that um, the, the residency kind of gave me the kind of the space and time to actually think about these things that I hadn't really put down in words as such until now, but I think it's actually, and I didn't realize until, until we were talking about this, Duncan, that that there is a lot of, I mean, obviously echoes is a, an acoustic phenomenon and, and, but I didn't realize how, how important all of those things are and kind of the idea of kind of music and harmonies and, and everything like that, like that really does come into play. And, and it's funny that I didn't hear, I mean, I, I mentioned in, in the talk that I didn't hear that the fact that my English is Hiberno English, I, I'd always thought of that it was it was very standard and you know didn't have those things, that I didn't recognize them until somebody else heard them first. And then I went, oh yes, you know, they're they're there. And it's funny because Hiberno English and and English in Ireland is this the oral tradition is so strong, that whole sense of telling stories and and rhythms and and you know the cadence of the way people speak. And especially where I grew up, where I grew up in Cork and, and the language is extremely, the, the accent is very sing-song and very, very rhythmic and, and hard to understand <laughs> mm -hmm. unless, unless you've heard it for quite a long time. And I didn't realise myself how important that kind of um, the, the spoken, the spoken aspect of hearing, hearing your work and hearing your translation, because obviously we work with words on a page rather than, we're, you know, we don't do the, you know, well, I certainly don't do the interpreting side of side of things but it, it's still a huge hugely important part of your work as a translator I think is just hearing those words aloud so yes I do I do <laughs> I do a lot of talking to myself and, and reading and reading out loud to myself and sometimes I subject my husband or other people <laughs> to it as well. Um, does that then I mean thinking then about your uh, interest in uh, the the uh, echoes and in this this more kind of conversational uh, literary style. Presumably, then that affects your choice of uh, of material to translate. Uh, I uh, there's a a, a question uh, in the Q and A from uh, Lottie yeah. Five. Um, fascinating talk, Laura. Thank you. Do you have a favourite genre of work to translate? Again, asking about your. Uh, your your the material that you have a, a preference for. Yeah. I know it's it, it can be very uh, difficult when you're getting started as a translator to, yeah. to to be able to kind of realize any preferences because you might have to accept work that you're given. But <laughs> and, 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 and think, from your position now, presumably you're able to exert rather more agency in in the well, uh, <laughs> a little a little more agency, probably not as you know not not a huge amount yet, but. Um, Certainly, I think with with the Bell the Bell Olid collection of short stories was was it wasn't something that I necessarily brought a hundred percent to an author in the sense of a pitch or anything like that, but it was um, to sorry to a publisher, um, but it was part of a conversation about what I'm attracted to and, and the kind of books that I am interested in, and I've been lucky in the sense that my my career so far has. Has kind of followed the same trajectory as as my interests in in that I'm I'm more drawn to kind of those female very strong female voices or you know it's some it's, you know I, I have translated more more female authors than male to be fair but I think I think I am drawn to a very again I mean it, it's a very nebulous con con concept in a sense but like a strong voice when you hear a strong voice in a text 
I think those ones I find most um, most kind of rewarding to translate because it takes the little time to 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 find that voice to find the voice of that of authors in English mm. it can be a challenge and sometimes it, it, it is hugely rewarding um so I mean I don't I haven't had a, a huge amount of agency it's only in the last couple of books that there's been some agency um but I think I've been lucky it's just been that that my my interests have tallied with the work that I've been given and it is that kind of mostly a strong female voice I think mm. that I'm drawn to can I can I ask you um about echoes i mean you were uh, strongly in your talk um uh, bringing out the the idea of the the translator as reader uh, yeah. and reading and the first step being to kind of pick up on the echoes of the text mm -hmm. that, you're, that you're reading the um and i suppose my, my, i i was wondering then as a translator are you then do you feel that you it's your job then to recreate where possible those same echoes for your reader or again i suppose this is a question for 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 you as translator are you looking to uh recreate the echoes that you've experienced or are you because i was thinking as well um the notion of liberation suggests that you're kind of liberating something that's in the text mm -hmm. uh, and potentially that could be read at, as, as in tension with notions of the translator as creator um, yeah are you are you perhaps looking to create new echoes of your own as a i suppose i suppose um i mean it, it comes back to the the translator as reader a little bit, I think, in that what it, how how you read like, uh, well, I f I feel that everything that I've read leads to how I how I engage with anything I read. Like it's it's all shaped by everything that you've read before. You know, like it's a kind of a, a cumulative um, reading experience. So all of the books I've read before are influencing how I'm reading a book now, and it necessarily will influence how I translate something because I'm doing it from my perspective and my subjective perspective as a reader as well. So I suppose, I mean, I, if I am trying to recreate, I suppose I'm trying to recreate the, the echoes that I'm experiencing in, in the source text, but I'm very aware that, you know, somebody could, you know, another, especially another Catalan, translator might read one of the books that I've translated in Catalan and have completely different echoes. Like, I don't believe that, I think that the echoes are always going to be different. They're always dependent on the reader. I don't believe that they're going to be the same for you as they would be for me if we read the same book. Mm. So I think it comes down to that sense of the reading experience automatically leads to a translation experience that's going to be slightly different. And there's going to be slightly different words where you feel, okay, this ties in, you know, uh, and I mean, I'm not, I suppose what I wouldn't want is that people think that it's a prescriptive thing that I must do something because, you know, Daniel Defoe did this in Robinson Crusoe. It's it's not that. It's more just those things that kind of, um, is, you know, set, set the neurons firing in your mind from what you've read. And, and I think, I do think that being a reader and bookseller means that I have a kind of a, an involuntary kind of like, Oh well, if somebody like this, they'd like this. You know, like there is that kind of thing that you develop as a bookseller, um, and and it's it's probably easier. It might be slightly easier for me to get to those moments. But my my feelings about um, the kinships that I see are not necessarily going to be kinships that someone else sees. So I suppose in my translations, I I want people to see the same ones as me, but not in a kind of a didactic, prescriptive way. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, nice comment from uh, from Naomi uh, Solovel. Hello from a fellow court person living Hello. in the UK for almost 20 <laughs> years. The idea of Hiberno English echoes in a translation is very interesting and something I'll definitely look out for in my own translations now. Mm -hmm. um, Fionn Petch has a question. As a Scot, I relate very closely to what you said about being surprised to find your own normal ways of expressing things are not standard English. <laughs> I've also tried to draw on echoes of Scots and Hiberno English in my translations and wonder how, <laughs> and this, this is the question, how uh, has this played out with editors for you? Is there, uh, if there are still certain expectations about what English should be? 
Um, I mean, because like I, I have kind of a, a I mean, we won't go too far down this this rabbit hole necessarily, but I have a kind of a, a mix and une a slightly uneasy feeling about Irishness in that I don't feel I don't feel almost as if I don't own certain phrases and things because they weren't something that were used in my family. So I don't feel I don't feel you know that I have a license in a sense to kind of use certain phrases even though I love them because I kind of think oh I don't know whether I'm kind of just um I, I don't uh, what I wouldn't want is to kind of put some kind of faux you know kind of something that didn't feel natural to me necessarily and but in my case I mean I genuinely believed have believed all the way through my career that 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 the English that I spoke and the English that I was I was producing my translations was very very standard and very straightforward and there was going to be no and it was it was an editor who actually drew drew my attention to it and said oh I can hear these things and I was like what oh you know because it was completely unintentional I didn't mean it but I've come to see in the last couple of books it's like well this is something that's just innate it's something that's part of me and and you know I can't not that I was trying to knock it out of myself or anything, I wasn't, I, I genuinely wasn't aware of it. Um, but I think, I think it really depends on the editor in, in, in what I've seen. I think I've had editors who have been a bit more um, normative in, in their approach or wanting to kind of make non-standard grammar and not necessarily even Hiberno-English, but um, non-standard grammar. And they want to kind of like, you know, smooth out the edges. They don't, they don't want those kind of signs of something slightly odd or a bit unusual so I think I think personally it depends on the editor and what 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 they're what they're interested in in the text as well because I mean I mean I, I I did I workshopped a little bit of of this book that I'm working on now um with in the BCLT's course in November and and there was a couple of people there who were really interested in kind of like pushing pushing the boundaries of, of um, the non-standard English. And mm. it, was, it was fascinating to me. And I, the, one, one or two of those little kind of non-standard things are actually in my work in progress at the moment. And I'm prepared to have an argument <laughs> um, with the editor about those and kind of like make it, make it, make an, you know, an argument for those things. So, I mean, I think it really depends on the editor and it depends on, it depends on the book. I think it's very, book dependent and editor dependent, I would say. Thank you. Yes, uh, you gave that example in your talk, didn't you, of uh, the time when uh, you, you uh, tried to argue it out with an editor and, and didn't win, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not always uh, uh, successful, but uh, yeah. Paul uh, Spalding Mulcott says, I'm a book reviewer, a very poor relation to the craft of translation. However, this talk has given me so much to ponder. And he asked uh, in um, the opening question, in fact, have you considered developing the ideas inherent in this lecture so as to become a book? <laughs> so Paul's, Paul's wondering if you're if you're going to write a book. Babs uh, has a follow up question, um, mm -hmm. and she refers to Danny Hahn's uh, recent publication, Catching Fire: His Translation Diary, which uh, um, uh, uh, many of us were uh, following when as it was uh, uh, coming out uh, last year. Um, and Babs asks, uh, following on from Paul's uh, question, Danny Hahn has just published this translation diary and translation, uh, translator afterwards and notes are increasingly common and enjoyed mm -hmm. by readers. Can we expect to read more on your process <laughs> in any of these formats? I suppose I could distill all that down to a question about, um, do you, I mean, as a translator, mm -hmm. are you looking to use these more sort of paratextual perhaps um, opportunities, uh, uh, footnotes and um, translators, prefaces and things to try and kind of prime your, your, your readers or to bring across some of these uh, thoughts that you've been sharing with us today? I mean, <laughs> I would love that opportunity. <laughs> um, I, I, I really, I, I, I really, since the beginning, since the beginning of my, my career as a translator, it's really interesting in, in, I know, we're obviously talking to um, we're preaching to the choir here a little bit because people are interested in translation if they're at this talk. But I, f I really feel that there's 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 real interest that has developed in that kind of, as you said, paratextual kind of um, 
the, the kind of the paraphernalia around translation that, you know, there is, there's more and more, I've read more and more, I think I've read more translators forwards and, or afterwards in the last maybe three years than I had seen in, you know, the previous 15. So I think there's more, there's definitely more of an appetite um, for just for readers and editors to kind of incorporate a little bit more of that. I mean, I have kept notes on and off about during the translations that I've been doing. And I mean, I would love the opportunity to write a bit more about it for sure. Um, and maybe, I mean, maybe there's there's a place for in the work that I'm doing now, maybe there's a place for um, an afterward in, in the book that I'm doing at the moment. Um, I certainly think that there is a, there's enough material there um, that could be discussed, it could be interesting. So, I mean, yes, I mean, obviously in an ideal world, I love that experience because I think, I thought da Danny's, his, his process, his discussion of his process was fascinating. It was so interesting because I was following it as a, on a, on a day by day, you know, as he was, as he was doing it. And then obviously it's become a book. Um, and it's funny because so many translators are reading the book, that book before reading the fiction, which was probably not necessarily what was intended, but you know, like there is that thing where it's a real neck and neck between which is which book is being read first, which is fascinating. So, I mean, I would love to, but you know, we'll see what what format that would take. <laughs> Thank you. Um, question from Rob Meyer: uh, What is your approach to localizing specific cultural elements? I think here of say a popular TV show, a chocolate bar, or other branded snack, etc. Are you in favour of? adapting these to more local variants, uh, maintaining the original and using footnotes, or as I would put it, simplifying it to an evening comedy program, a chocolate bar, etc., mm. or a mix of all three. So specific cultural ideas. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think it very much, again, I mean, I, I, I don't want to use this <laughs> answer for every single question, but I think it really depends Certainly in my experience, there's been things where I have kept, I've kept a reference that is very specific to, to the culture, the, the source culture, basically, and kind of thought to myself, well, you know, if, if a reader is reading this book, they're going to be interested in this place or, you know, this culture and will, you know, if they're really interested in finding out with this, they'll know it's a TV show, for example, but they'll, if they want to know the specifics, they can they can find that there's so much information out there now that they can find it. Mm. Um, and then another, I think there was another case where I think an editor localized something because they didn't feel. I think it came down to what kind of effect is this having on the reader in English. And it's not necessarily having the same effect. I mean, this this is why why things are domesticated, right? Or how you localize something is. Because you want to you want to rep reproduce the same effect on the reader that they have had as a as a reader of the language of your source language would have. Um, so I mean I'm not I'm not averse. I, I suppose I, my tendency is to avoid to avoid localizing too much if it's going to jar. I think that's what it is. I think if it suddenly sounds as if someone, if you've kind of resolutely kept the rest of the book say in Barcelona. And so, suddenly there's a reference to something that is very specifically Cork in, in my case. Is that going to is that going to be alienating for the reader in the sense of suddenly pulling them? They're in this kind of they're immersed in this particular world or this kind of you know culture, and then suddenly there's a lift into something else. So I think, I mean, again, it, it is for me, it very much depends on the book and it depends on what the book is doing, what you want to do, and whether or not that's going to over, I suppose my, the danger would be to over familiarize or over localize where it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it jars with the rest of the book. Mm. So I think, I think it really depends. I mean, I can't think of any, I'm trying to think of any examples now. I think I've been quite, uh, quite lucky really in the things that I've been translating have not necessarily had a very specific other than the crime novels, but they're very obviously Barcelona, so you couldn't really mm. over-localize there. I think the other ones have all been very, um, 
they've not had a very specific sense of place or we're not one that's discernible to the reader. Yeah, it's an, in it's an interesting question. I think it's something that you, it's, it's, it's hard to come down on one side or the other because it's, it, it, it tends to depend on the book and, and yeah, the actual content of the book really, I think. Sorry, that's a real non-answer. <laughs> no, let, let me let me try and draw you out a bit further. I mean, does it also is one of the things that it depends on as well your construction of your reader, because yeah, yeah, you're thinking so. about your you're, you're thinking about echoes uh, and kind of creating echoes for your reader as a translator. Mm. So much is going to depend, presumably, then on how many echoes you think your reader is going to be able to pick up on. Um, and whether uh, in ultimately then the competence of, of your reader as you see it to, uh, to pick up on echoes, perhaps in the same way as you have uh, yeah. or not. I suppose, you, I mean, I wouldn't, I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't, I mean, as I said, I've only really formalized my thoughts on this during the residency, but I think I wouldn't want to alienate someone. I suppose I wouldn't want to kind of like, put forth my my opinion to the point that somebody else can't enter into the book in the same way you know so mm. there's a there's a certain kind of like uh, a tension between your ideas and what what you know the echoes that you hear but you don't want them to to block anybody else from being able to kind of enter that space with you like I mean yeah. it can't just be for a reader of one you know like just just me. <laughs> it has to be kind of somewhat, you have to keep the, the text somewhat open as well for other people to, because I mean, other people have to make meaning as well. I mean, and I, I've certainly found that with them um, because I've been doing quite a few events with Bell around the publication of Wilder Winds and a couple of the, the, the questions um, were amazing because there were just things that neither Belle nor I had had thought about at all and somebody said oh I see all these connections between you know these different stories and there was different things and different things in common and I'm like, oh I just I never noticed that but it's absolutely true and it was it was about um it was about the presence of water the water comes in comes up in four or five different stories in different you know like a river or the sea or you know like but there's lots of things about water and the whole idea of these characters being immersed in water and what does that mean and <laughs> we were blown away because it, it was just something that I hadn't even hadn't occurred to either of us so I suppose you want you want your translations to be open open to other other people making meaning as well thank you there's a, a follow-up question in fact from uh... Isabel Vaquero in the mm -hmm. chat. Thank you ever so much for a fantastic talk, Laura. This might be a bit of a redundant question now. I don't think it is. Um, but I wonder how you would approach the translation of a text which purposefully includes references to other literary texts in a kind of veiled way. Uh, and that interplay added another layer of meaning if said texts were relatively unknown among the target language readers. So would you resort to footnotes? Would you explain in a foreword? Hmm. I mean, I think it's it's a really interesting question, actually. I mean, I would I would tend to prefer a foreword because I think I think it gives it, it gives an overall context and it gives an overall picture of what you're trying to do rather than I mean, I love a footnote, but I know not everybody does. <laughs> but it, it, I think sometimes footnotes can pull you out of of the story that you're reading, whereas I think before a foreword or an afterward tend to give a, an overall picture of what you're doing in the translation and what you wanted to do. Um, I'm just thinking I had one, I, I, I translated a different story um, by Bell, um, which is not published. It was, it was for, it was being entered in the magazine. And there was a, a, a reference to a Catalan author that I was not familiar with, had heard of vaguely, but I wasn't familiar with. And I think in that story, there was something, it was a, there was a very specific reference to the story. So you kind of had to know the story and so I ended up reading the story and, and looking for it. And I think in the translation, I said I made, I added a little bit of text. There was a couple of words. I mean, it's in a, in a similar way to when I said in Spanish and stone in the landslide. I think there was just a few words to to ground the reference for the for the reader, because you know. And I think maybe I just said something like, because I mean, this is a Catalan classic a classic sci-fi author mm -hmm. and I think it was I think I said something like a classic sci-fi author 
blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, that the, the, the reader wouldn't necessarily have had to read the story, but could understand, I think maybe I put the context of what kind of author it was as well. Like, and that was a, a local reference, like, um, like a, a H.P. Lovecraft kind of, there was some kind of reference, like Lovecraftian or something, you know, that I said, and that that would be enough to signal to an English speaking reader who knows, who might not even know Lovecraft's work, but would know of Lovecraft. And that might be enough. So, I mean, I think, I think, yeah, I mean, if, if in that case, I mean, there's no way that the reader in English would know who this Catalan author was because I, I, I you know, I vaguely heard of it, but, you know, it's, I don't think they're published in English mm. or at least was published in the 70s, but isn't currently available now. And so I think it's that. I think, I think you, you find, you find, I mean, the difference would be that it, like for a Catalan author, this person would be extremely well known and probably studied in school so you do lose a little bit of that familiarity I think but yeah I think that's what I would do in those in those circumstances maybe would add within the text if it was a very complex thing I would say a forward would be lovely but not all not all editors will agree to a forward or a footnote for that matter so if that's the case then you would only have um, recourse to making an addition in the text mm. Mm. Thank you. I, I suppose it's about translating a text with its context, isn't it? And that can be quite mm -hmm. a fr frustrating task at times when you're when you don't have, as you're saying, when when you're not given the option to include footnotes or uh, or, or prefaces, and uh, and it puts that much extra strain on the translation to kind of incorporate mm -hmm. all those those extra yeah. features. I'm 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 um, put in mind actually of of, of Clyde James's um, uh, translation of Dante, where he he set himself yes. the, the task of not including any footnotes at all. Um, yeah. And, and putting, <laughs> yeah. It all, putting it all into the the translation, but that's a bit extreme. That, that's 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 very daunting. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's an interesting. It's it's yeah. I mean, I think I think make friends with your editor <laughs> would be the, the 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 piece of advice i would give in that sense because if you can kind of i mean certainly i mean i was christina mcsweeney did this that amazing um piece in oh i've forgotten the name of it now is it um it's a chronology but it's they call it something else oh it's on the tip of my tongue but she, you know, she worked with the author. She had a trans, you know, she was able to work with uh, Valeria Luiselli and one of her books, and they had this amazing chronology that they created together. And it was, and they ended up using it's actually been used in translations now into other languages, mm. which wasn't in the original, but they felt that they needed something for the reader in English. And it became this amazing piece of piece of writing um, that kind of gives the context of. The kind of historical context for a non-Mexican reader of all these things that they would all that they would know, you know, like the back of their hand, and it puts it in the context of, of you know, what a British reader or an American reader would understand as well. So it gives that sense of like, oh, this is what was going on. Yes, the story of my teeth. Thank you very much. <laughs> I couldn't remember which one it was, um, but yes, it's just it was it's so brilliant because it, it's it was it was entirely original in the English translation and yes it's now being used in all the translations that have been happening since because it's it's so perfect it's such a brilliant example of um translator and well translator and author coming together but um also just um the context being able to tra translating the context for the reader there's a a, a nice question from uh, Catherine Heller um uh, about the translator reader relationship, do you feel that the development in the translator reader relationship has been influenced by the increase in discussion spaces and reader communities online? Uh, I'm researching manga and anime translation, Catherine says, and how fan communities have influenced translation approaches. So yeah. it'd be interesting to hear how you feel about this kind of thing in the area of literary translation. I don't feel I'm not sure that I have it, it has had the same it, it certainly hasn't had the same impact I don't think but it's you know I th I think that in general the discussion of, of translation and you know I mean in no small part to the, the activities of the BCLT but you know like that sense of just that sense of there's a real sense of um 
talking about it and actually understanding it and, and really being engaged with it. Um, I don't necessarily think that there's a fan situation, you know, like there's an equivalent in literary translation to the manga situation. I don't think there is necessarily the same, the same level of in, the same impact, but um, it certainly feels as if, I mean, when I first started, well, I mean, there's two things. When I first started as a translator, people were really kind of had no real understanding of what that meant or what, what you did or, you know, and kind of assumed that you could just translate everything if you could speak a different language. And I was going, well, no, no, that's not that's really how it is. And I, I feel like there's been a real sea change in how people see translation. And I think, you know, all to the good. I mean, and, and as we see, like the afterwards and the forwards coming through. So I'm not sure that I see a direct parallel between the manga, the situation in, in the manga world and comic world. Um, but I do think that there's been a real um, sea change in terms of how people see translation and talk about translation and the spaces, the number of spaces are increasing constantly. Um, and, you know, with reviewers like Paul and, and lots of other reviewers who are really interested in translated work, um, there's just a real visibility that, you know, that there's a visibility that wasn't there 10 years ago, I don't think. Mm. Um, but yeah, so I'm sorry, that's a kind of like, you know, I don't, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe, you know, of a equivalent situation, don't you? <laughs> well, I was just thinking, I mean, you, you said before that you've been doing quite a lot of, uh, of readings um, and public appearances um, yeah. with, with, uh, with your author, and mm -hmm. that, that presumably then is, that that's a, a, a space for direct interaction with your uh, readers uh, as yeah. well as you know as well as uh, uh, an occasion like this where um, uh, the the chat opportunities for uh, interaction as well that I mean I I will say that I mean I know it, it it came from a global pandemic but it feels as if the 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 the, the spaces that have developed because of COVID and, and everything becoming hybrid or going lots of things going online has really added um, a layer of, you know, that, that, that directness. It is that direct, you know, because I mean, if you go to a talk, if you go to a talk or a, um, a reading, you know, in real life, um, it's all very, and it, it, it tends to be, I don't mean it tends to be quite polite, that, that you know, they're not, not to say that they're not polite, but I just mean that there, there's a real direct thing and they will ask questions and they ask questions throughout. Whereas I think sometimes it can be quite form, you know, it's quite formal. Sometimes they can be quite formal. And it doesn't feel like you can kind of ask as many questions or, you know what I mean? It doesn't. And I feel like there's been a real democratization of, of, of the process of talking about books and, and, you know, seminars and all that kind of thing. So it, it's, it's a great, I mean, it, it's amazing. I mean, I think I've only done, I've only done one in-person event and all the other ones have been, you know, you know, book clubs or, um, talks or launches and all this kind of thing has been online mm -hmm. and it's been it's been incredible I think because you do get that direct feedback from people when people say that this is really interesting or that they really want to know more about this and mm -hmm. and I don't think you get you know that I, I just feel the questions in real life tend to be a bit more um, reserved. <laughs> There's a, uh, a contribution in the chat from uh, Olivia Hellowell. Hello, uh, Olivia, uh, Hello, your Olivia. predecessor as uh, a BCLT translator in residence uh, uh, last year. And uh, Olivia's uh, added a, a link there. Uh, she says, Christina talks about it in uh, talking about uh, the story of my teeth, I think, in an episode of yeah. Lemos Escritoras uh, and a link there. Um, there are no open questions, I see. Um, and you've already answered, uh, well, you've answered all the questions of our <laughs> uh, audience, and uh, we've uh, certainly put you through your paces uh, <laughs> this afternoon, uh, Laura. So um, before we uh, conclude, though, I did want to um, mention uh, some other things that we have uh, coming up in uh, the in May June uh, BCLT research seminars. Our next speaker. Um, is Michael Cooperson uh, from UCLA, who will be speaking on the 11th of May about his uh, groundbreaking translation of Al-Hariri's 
impostures and we have an Arabic theme uh, continuing through May, a week later on the 18th of May, um, we have a round table hosted by our other uh, current <laughs> translator in residence and that's Savad Hussein. Um, and uh, Savad is going to be joined by the editors of the new Routledge anthology of Arabic discourse uh, on translation. Um, so two uh, Arabic themed events in May. And um, I was uh, delighted, Laura, that you began your talk uh, uh, referencing uh, Zebat lectures, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, referencing uh, Ali Smith and uh, uh, Jumpa Lahiri. And just a reminder then uh, that uh, the next, our next uh, 2022, uh, Zibat lecture is also coming up and that's just into June on the 1st of June and that will be given by Lydia Davis uh, and uh, you can register for that on the British Library website. Uh, I think those are all the uh, announcements that I wanted to make. Um, I think we can we can uh, close uh, today's event, but not before, uh, Laura, I say thank you so much again for your really, clearly from the, uh, from the, the uh, questions that we've had, your really uh, inspiring and uh, fascinating uh, talk. And the notion of echoes, I think is gonna be echoing uh, for, <laughs> for quite a while uh, with our audience, uh, certainly with me. I mean, you, we've, as you alluded to, we've already had uh, a uh, discussion uh, around this uh, in advance of the uh, talk today. Um, we're so lucky to have you as our uh, translator in residence and you'll be doing more um, with our uh, students, I know, um, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the time uh, to come. But for, for the moment then, thank you so much, Laura, and thank you thank to you. Uh, everyone uh, for listening. Thank you so much. <laughs>